you know, black men don't always feel like there's a safe space for them to open up. And so what I, what I would encourage any black man out there listening is to know that you're enough. Just you being here, just you being alive, just you breathing right now. If you can hear me speaking to you, you have value. Hey, Justin, thank you so much for joining us. Let's start off with why is mental health important to you personally? For me growing up, it wasn't like it wasn't something that was ever talked about by my family, by my friends. It wasn't a safe space for it. So for me personally, is important because I want to kind of rewrite history, my own personal history. And then as I look at the history of us as a society, there's so many people who also didn't have a safe space for mental health conversations. And so I think it's important that we create spaces to talk about the things that maybe were swept underneath the rug for so many years. And, you know, I think it's important that as individuals, we take back our power and take back, you know, the ability to be in control of our mind and what we, how we process things and what we allow into our minds, who we surround ourselves with and remembering that our mental health is just as important as our physical health. Amen to that. And I feel like in certain areas in the world, people are definitely seeing mental health as important as physical health. And there's still a long way to go, but I, there's so many, I, I feel so many less experiences with stigma as someone living with mental health conditions that I felt many years ago. And the shame that I once felt went away because I feel like there's this more of an embracing community around it and people like stepping up to the plate like you and becoming advocates and sharing their story and letting people know they're not alone. Yeah, I think if we just if we just share our stories and we have these conversations, we're all doing our part to reduce the stigma. What type of mental health issues have you dealt with in the past or present? I used to cut. I was a severe self-harmer, so I still have scars on my wrist today. Initially, not cutting necessarily for suicide ideation at first, more so just to, as a release. Most cutters are just trying to just release the pain. Um, my family started to notice and they knew that I had some things going on. So eventually they took me to two places, one, um, a psychiatrist and one, a psychotherapist. Right. And I did some group therapy with other teens and I was diagnosed with depression and I was diagnosed with attention deficit, um, hyperactive disorder, also known as ADHD. So for that, um, this was maybe 16, 17 as a teenager, I was prescribed, uh, Effexor and, uh, a medicine called Vivant. So I was medicated. And to be honest, I didn't really like how the medicine made me feel. It, it did help, but I usually kind of felt like a zombie. My friends would notice that something was off. Um, I had my first real suicide attempt at 19 after high school. I just dealt with a lot of bullying, finding myself, um, growing up with high expectations in a super religious household. It just, the youngest of four, I had ran away from home a few different times. I, I, I went through some things. I dealt with weight issues. So, you know, talking to someone in therapy was helpful, but there was still something like something left out there for me to kind of overcome, you know, but that was really what I dealt in my late teens, still in high school, going into college. Eventually, when I kind of got into my 20s, I came off the medicine, stopped going to therapy. And that's kind of where things took not so good of a turn because I was really just self-medicating through partying, never really like got into drugs or anything like that, but just partying a lot, drinking a lot, being around the wrong crowd, kind of rebelling was just my way to kind of cope through some of the issues I was still dealing with, but just was masking at that point. Wow. Thanks for sharing all of that so openly with us. We appreciate that. What I would say to people too, I know there's plenty of people who are on medicine and by all means, if they feel like that's the best, you know, way for them, you know, consult with your, with your doctor. Right. Uh, for me at this point in my life, it's not what I want to be on. I don't want to be on medication. I'm able to function without it. Um, but I do have to remind my friends and family that I still do deal with depression, ADHD. I might go about it, you know, therapy, um, therapy in a different way. Uh, but there's still a need for some concern, right? But I just, medicine wasn't my route. But I do encourage people to at least go to a, a physician and explore what their options might be individually. For sure. For me, it took a few years to find the right combination of medication so I could be high functioning, sleep well, be productive and not compromise my personality or just like my happiness. So um, I think it's great that you're functioning without meds, but I sometimes see shirts that say like 
meditate, don't medicate or whatever, stuff like that. Right. And I'm like, both. I meditate and I medicate because I need both, you know, and it doesn't have to be one or the other. It's not like self-care instead of medication. Turns out a lot of people do best on meds and with CBT or on meds and with a self-care routine. And other people are fine just with CBT or DBT or in self-care and spirituality and finding their community. There's no one way to heal. So I think it's great that you found what works best for you. Yeah. Good. And a good place. For sure. That's good. Me too. I'm very blessed right now. I know there's like, I like to be really grateful of the good times because I know they don't last forever and be really patient through the bad times because those don't last forever too. That is true. Why do you think a lot of men have a hard time opening up about mental health? What is that all about? <sighs> that's a deep question. Men having a hard time to open up. Um, first of all, this idea of what, what is it to be a man? And when you grow up as a man and the pressures that society puts on us is to provide, to perform. You know, there was a comedian one time who told a joke and says, you know, men might be the only species that aren't loved unconditionally. Like dogs are loved unconditionally, babies, but men are typically loved on the condition that you provide something. So our value as men is typically tied to what we can provide. What can I do for my partner, for my friends, for my family? It doesn't have to just be financial. It could be a bunch, a, a bunch of things, but financial is usually a big part of it. Performance and providing. And then when you're in a position where you lack confidence in your ability to provide or perform, that affects you mentally. And then as men, you're told things as a boy like, don't cry or man up. Those are probably two of the most harmful things you can ever say to a young man because it teaches us to suppress our emotions, to bottle the emotions, just to pretend that we're okay because we have to live up to this idea of what it is to be a man. So we I have to be strong for my woman. I have to be strong for my mom. I can't shed a tear. And then a lot of young men don't know how to properly channel their emotions. And unfortunately, it leads a lot of men to the grave, it leads them to prison, to a life of crime, to domestic violence, all these things where we see men acting out. It, you can usually trace it back to something mental health related, something in their childhood where they weren't given a safe space to emotionally be vulnerable. And so that's why I think it's so difficult for young men is because we haven't been given that many safe spaces. And then obviously me speaking as a black man in the, in the BIPOC community, that much more so because now you're in a marginalized community. So it's even harder for you because you're a minority and there's a bunch of things that come with that. And unfortunately, we see about a three to one ratio of completed suicide for men um, to women. And so, you know, my, my hope is that we continue to see spaces created for men to know that it's OK not to be OK. You don't always have to have it figured out. You don't have to have this pressure put on you. And I want to see more women creating that safety net to allow men to be emotionally vulnerable because of that has led to a lot of us being the way we are today, where we're stoic, where we don't show emotion and we don't necessarily know how because we were never taught to. There's a huge onus on parents, right, um, when it comes to the upbringing of of children, because a lot of the work I do focuses on children, because I believe if we can, that that's when we're the most impressionable, where our minds are still developing. And if we can change the stigma at that age, they're, they're going to grow up to be healthier minded adults, right? By the time they get to our age. Well, to this day, I'm, I'm now 30 years of age. I've never seen my father cry. Wow. Ever. And I was having a conversation with my brother a few months ago, and he said that he said he saw dad cry a long time ago. I says, I've never seen it with my eyes. So typically as kids, we grow up to want to be like our parents. We, 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 it's, we do what we see them do. Like our experiences, our thought processes until we're old enough to change it comes from our parents. So if our parents aren't taking care of their mental health, imagine the, the result that that's going to have on us as children. And so, you know, I think back and I'm not a father at this point, but when I become a father, I want to make sure that I parent different. I'm not bashing my parents or my father in particular, but I did what I saw because that's what I thought was normal. If, if, but that's the generational trauma aspect, right? Because it's probably mm -hmm. true that his father didn't do it either and his father before then. So it's like, all right, 
at some point we can continue to talk about the issue or we can change it. We change it by recycling this trauma. And, and, and um, one thing that Jason Wilson, he's a, he's a, a mental health speaker. He said the other day, he says, just like you can pass down trauma, you can pass down healing. And so that's what I wish to see going further is the trauma was passed down to me from my father because he didn't possibly know how to emo be emotional in front of his wife, in front of his children. He raised four boys and he didn't want he didn't want the, them to see him in a weak smoke moment. Now, as a man myself, I need my children to see me like that because I want them, particularly my boys. If I have a son, I need him to see his father in that state. So that way he knows it's okay. So I go back to parents can play a huge role in shaping that child's mind and letting them know that it's okay to not be okay. Really, it is so incredible because we can technically blame our parents up to a point, but once we become adults, we can say it's up to me. I'm the one who's in charge of my wellness now. I'm the one in, in charge of my mindset, and I'm going to take action and do what I can to make sure the next generation is healthier. Yeah, you're right. I love that. Self-accountability. Accountability. I love it. Yeah, for sure. And also, what does blame get us? Like, It gets us nowhere. You can maybe... You know, it's an excuse, but it doesn't really help you get anywhere. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a bad thing. There's acknowledgement and then there's blame. Acknowledging what happened is a part of your story, like about what role that your, plant, your parents or your environment or your school, whatever, plays in your upbringing, in your thought processes. But to your point, at some point, you do have to acknowledge that and then move forward and say, what am I going to do now? So what can we do to raise more awareness for mental health? Ah, that's, that is a loaded question. What can we do to raise more awareness? So this is going to be an interesting response. The first thing is I, I don't think awareness is enough. And so awareness is an important first step. But one thing that I preach in a lot of the activities I do on my, my weekly um, support group sessions on my podcast is action. I like mental health action because it's awareness is an important step because there's a lot of people out there today who aren't aware of what mental health is. So getting them to the point of, Hey, this is an issue. Let's talk about it is great. But if we stay in just a sense of a state of, we're just merely aware there's an issue. We never do anything about it. What are we doing? So I love mental health action. So along those lines is get involved locally, right? Find out what's going on in your community where you can impact. Um, for me personally, a few months ago, after coming back from a couple of trips speaking across the country, I came back to Virginia where I'm from and there was an American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, a suicide walk right here locally. And I went and supported it. I met the person who was in charge of it, interviewed her for the podcast. I met a bunch of other organizations locally that, that preach and live mental health um, from uh, one particular organization is called Enjoy, and they do some community building right here in the Norfolk, Virginia Beach area where I'm from. And that gave me so much exposure to see where I can impact right in my own community. And so that's an important step is that's actionable because now I'm outside. I'm out there. I'm with the community. I'm hearing the stories of people who have lost ones to suicide. I'm I'm seeing it right at the ground level, and it puts me in a, a, a better position to impact and influence change. Um, outside of that, checking in with your friends and your family. You know, there's a saying that goes around a lot, check in on your strong friends, check in on all your loved ones. Shoot them a text. Hey, how, how, how you doing? normalize asking someone how are you and actually waiting for the real response because a lot of times the first thing we say isn't the truth being there to support someone not to fix their problems because a lot of times i i struggle with this i'm the fixer guy i'm like how can we fix this issue sometimes people just want you to be there and just listen and support and not feel alone so imagine doing that on a small level because a lot of people say well i can't go speak on this stage like you or go be here and do some of the things that Dr. Alfie does, you can impact stuff right in your own family, your own friendships, your own community, because now that starts to reverse the, the stigma. Because imagine you go in today and ask someone that you really love and care about, how are you? How can I help you? How can I support you? Maybe they haven't heard that in months or at all. And now the way you might make them feel, how you might make them feel loved and supported how that can go a long way to helping them deal with whatever they might be hiding or masking. Just setting the right example 
um, I think is super important. So that way we're not just in the mental health awareness bag. We are now like mental health action. It starts with yourself too. <laughs> Setting the example with your own self-care, your own self-love, because that's contagious, right? I want to continue to see the celebrities and the superstars continue to talk about mental health and self-care because when they do it, it looks cool, right? And that spreads and people, oh, that's cool. You're, you mean to tell me you're, you're not, you're, you're, you're stopping uh, people, people, you're not going to people please. You're going to say no and just take some time for yourself and miss out on that and go, go on a walk. That's cool. Maybe I should try it. So imagine if each individual challenged themselves to do something more for themselves, self-care, self-love related, mental health related, that can become a contagious bug that can spread in a good way to other people to see where there's opportunities for them to, to be in control of their mental health. And a few actionable free things you could do for your self-care are go on a walk in nature, listen to um, uplifting podcasts listen to a meditation, do yoga with Adrian for free on YouTube, call a friend and check in with each other. Um, what else? Write down your intentions. What are your intentions for the day, the week, the month, or even for the year? Write down gratitudes, say affirmations in the mirror. So those are just a few things. Breath work. I yeah. keep going on and on. There's so many free things we could do that are so in, like you said earlier, getting involved in the community, volunteering your time, being a pillar in the community and offering support or just showing up to events and connecting with others who can relate. Yeah. And I, and the, the thing too, and one, one message I want to send to everyone listening into the long list that you, that you, um, that you gave there. Remember that what your self care looks like might be different from what my self care looks like, but there's all different types of things that we can do to give time back to ourselves. The important thing is not what you do is that you do something right. You find what it is, that serves you. I'm giving a, a speech here next month about finding who you are, giving back time to yourself. And so that could be a process of finding what it is that you like, what it is that you love, what it is, when are you the happiest? What makes you the happiest? Who makes you the happiest? And go to those places of acceptance, go to those places of love, go to those places where you feel like your best self. And it could look different from all of us because we're all different human beings from different backgrounds. But it's important that you grab hold of it and be intentional and do something for yourself. Twitch and men's mental health in the black community. So um, while we do not know exactly why or how Twitch was struggling, his death represents a sobering reality that black men in particular have been taught expressing mental health struggles is a sign of weakness and under a lot of pressure to be less vulnerable and always show strength. What steps do you feel need to be addressed to the stigma and lift the pressure for men to be less vulnerable and always show strength? As a black person, when you see someone that looks like you, not far off from the same age, and they, they, they go that way, it affects you different, especially from someone like myself who has attempted suicide and, and deals with suicide ideation, have dealt with it. I know we'll get into that soon. So sometimes it's this like survivor's remorse, guilt type thing, where it's like, you know, you're still here and someone's gone. You know, as men, when a black man dies by suicide or any celebrity for that matter, a lot of people say, I can't believe it. He looked like he had it all. I can't, I can't believe it. And what he helped us to appreciate is that depression doesn't have a look. Someone can be high functional, look like us, smiling, go to work every day, and you never know that they're right on the edge of giving up. And I think as black men in the BIPOC space, we have it extremely difficult because every day on the news, we see people that look like us dying. And there's trauma that's been handed down to us generation after generation. And it's extremely hard to be a black man in America. And there's a lot of pressure that comes with that to be successful, to take care of your family. And at some point, a lot of men just feel like they don't have it in them to keep going. And that's extremely sad. It's, it's extremely sad that, you know, black men don't always feel like there's a safe space for them to open up. And so what I, what I would encourage any black man out there listening is to know that you're enough. Just you being here, just you being alive, just you breathing right now. If you can hear me speaking to you, you have value. So many black men have felt like they didn't have value. The world won't miss me. There's no reason for me to stay. 
And so I want to remind brothers that there's a reason for you to be here, that there's light at the end of the tunnel, that we can support you. I do some work with the organization called Black Men Heal. This is an organization, Ari, that offers free therapy to black men. Providers come in all across the country and they offer their services for free, for eight free sessions to men, to black men, to give them that therapy that's eluded them for so many years. And I have the privilege of doing some work behind the scenes with them in social media and at some of their events. And I've been in person to some of their events. And I think every black man in America needs to be there because these are free events. They bring you in, they talk to you, we come together, we hug each other. Cause a lot of us men didn't really get hugs as kids. We eat, we break bread, we talk about things. And it's from a multiple generations, from people in their teens to people in their 70s. And we talk about what it is, what it means to be a black man today in America struggling. And, and that has been one of the most powerful things for me that happened in 2022, because it allowed me to see firsthand how I could impact and influence my community. And I believe that if we see more spaces like that across the country, both in person and virtually, black men, supporting one another, coming together um, to, to love on each other, to remind each other that they're not alone, to affirm one another. Their slogan is that if you heal a man, one healed man can heal more men. And so that's what, what, what I'm dedicated to in memory of brothers like Twitch and the many more who we've lost and we will unfortunately lose in the future is continuing to do the work to go to the black men that we can help that we can provide a safe space to. And I think that that's my mission. I think that's why I'm here today is to let myself be an example and to go to the community and have these tough conversations. Justin, you promote a need for professional therapy on your social media platforms. Would you be willing to share your thoughts on that, please? I talk a lot about therapy because I believe that while therapy isn't for everyone, I think it's worth a try for everyone. And I want people to go to therapy with a purpose. I want them to try it and see if they can get something out of it. I want them to go to therapy with the goal because a lot of people say, you know, I went, I tried it. They didn't really give it their all. They might have just went and showed up to check a box. But did you really go in there? Did you listen? Did you try to do the work? Did you do what was suggested of you? Did you open up to give the therapist a chance to work with you? Because they can only do but so much if you don't do the work yourself, too. And so I, I think that everyone, no matter, you know, male, woman, however you identify, just to go and sit down with someone to get some of those emotions out that maybe you've compressed for so long and suppressed and being able to figure some things out from a different perspective, maybe reshaping your mind, reshaping your ideals and how you go about things could be of help. So I encourage my listeners to give it a try. Um, I don't speak from, from a hypocritical standpoint. I'm in therapy. It's helped me get through a divorce in 2022, um, some really other tough times I had to deal with has helped me. And one other note I'll leave you with too, is I would encourage the listeners, if you're employed, to check out your employee uh, resource group, ERG. Um, a lot of companies these days, because of the importance of mental health, have been adding more benefits for their employees for mental health. I happened to call into my job one day early in 2021, I believe, about taxes, about just getting some help with my taxes for the year. I came to find out that they offer up to eight free sessions a year of counseling per issue that you're dealing with through my company that's free of charge. And these are things that a lot of times people aren't aware of resources that are available. It's just because we just may not know. And those were things that I took advantage of before getting into an official therapy session. Just being able to talk to a counselor helped me through some things as well a few years back. So, you know, there's a lot of things out there to help us. I think therapy is at least worth your while to look into and give it a try. Give it a real honest try. And I think that it can really help you get through whatever you might be dealing with. What are your favorite recommended resources? Two major ones that I would point people in the direction of the A, um, AFSP, American Foundation of Suicide Prevention .org. You go there, you can find a lot of the community building, um, suicide walks and different activities that are happening in your community about suicide prevention. And it will point you in the direction of a bunch of resources. So um, American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, I would recommend. And then one big one that I love is NAMI, the National Alliance of Mental Illness. They have a plethora of information 
statistics, references, pointing you in the right direction. I, I've used a lot of the information off NAMI's website when I go to pod and get the, make sure my stats are right and the information I'm quoting is correct. So I use them religiously. So those two um, there alone will be great places just to get a start to just get more information because maybe you're just trying to figure out what's going on. You want more information. You just want a better sense of what's going on. Um, I would start there. I want to mention InnoPsych.com, uh, Dr. Charmaine Jackman. She's a clinical psychologist. This is a directory that's specifically for people of color because a lot of times people who are marginalized in these communities, um, when they're willing to try therapy, they're only going to do it if it's someone who looks like them or a person of color. And so there's been some directories, Therapy for Black Girls, InnoPsych, that create spaces where you can go and filter and find um, clinicians and therapists who are actual person of color and get all the information that you talked about, like what they specialize in and different things like that. So that's important. I just wanted to mention that. And then, of course, you know, I, I talked about blackmenheal.org that black men can apply for across the country. There's a virtual space they do every Sunday called King's Corner. They bring men together from all across the, the country to talk about, you know, uh, healing. And then one other one that I really, really love is my, my friend, uh, Joel Verlapangos. He's a Hollywood um, TV executive producer. He started something called Change Your Algorithm. I had him on the podcast in 2021. And what Change Your Algorithm is, is a free service where doctors, clin uh, clinical psychologists and therapists have volunteered their time pro bono to go online and host weekly classes, mental health classes. So they're not calling it therapy, right? They're not individualized there, but they're meant free mental health classes on different topics that people can call into and, and, and get some healing and get some important information and resources. So I just thought I'd mention a few that we can go on forever. There's so many out there, um, but do your, do your research there and make sure you find the best fit for you. Any resource in particular you think is great for youth? For youth. Uh, well, I'll just, I'll just uh, shameless plug here, but the amazing queen, Dr. Alfie, I just named the Acoma Project, the amazing work that she's doing with the Acoma Project outside of DC. Dr. Alfie's from, from the same city and state that I'm from, Virginia Beach, Virginia. So we're, we're going to hold it down for the, for the Virginia state here. But, um, she's done some amazing work. I've had a chance to see some of their sessions in person and they're going, as I mentioned earlier, my passions to youth, they're going to the kids, to the teenagers and doing activities in the school systems and educating them and creating programs for educators to teach children about mental health at that young age. And I love that that's their focus, that they're not trying to focus anywhere else but that because I believe that that's going to really, really uh, help them to be healthier minded adults. So check out the Acoma Project and all their work that they're doing. I know last year they partnered with uh, MTV, I think, in the White House and with, you know, uh, Joe Biden and, and, and uh, Jill Biden and Selena Gomez and all those amazing people at the Youth Mental Health Action Forum um, sponsored by MTV. So shout out to the Acoma Project and all the amazing work they continue to do for young uh, people's mental health. Amazing. Also, a really great resource I know for youth is a collaboration with Jack.org and Born This Way Foundation. It's called the Be There Certificate. You can go to BeThereCertificate.org and get certified in becoming a specialist in identifying people who are struggling with mental health in your community that you can learn how to support them and learn how to support your own mental health on your journey. So it's a great two-hour training that you can do online just to get better equipped with the signs and signals and how to be there. Beautiful. Thank you so much for doing this today, Justin. Yeah, I'm honored to have been on the platform. Thank you guys so much for having me as a guest. Hopefully we can do this again in the future. And thank you to, you know, to the folks at One Mind and, you know, all the work that you guys are doing.